Hey guys, reaching out to you with a fantastic opportunity. One of our great fans reached out to us recently and presented us a massive opportunity. Brent, you're a great guy. He's donated a custom built golf cart in a dead pair theme. He gave it to Jason and I for the dead pair podcast in order to go to a charity that we support. Of course, we turned this around and gave it to the Ronald McDonald House Kids and Clays program. So right now, you can go to www.deadpair.givesmart.com. On that website, you have an opportunity to purchase tickets to win this awesome golf cart, which will be delivered to the winner. There are photos of the golf cart online, as well as a link to a YouTube video where Brent shows the complete teardown, rebuild, customization of this cart. It is killer, guys. You don't want to miss out on this. Somebody's going to win it. We're going to give it away at Vero Beach in 2024 at the Caribbean Cup. It might as well be you. So go out there, buy those tickets, support a good cause, support the Ronald McDonald House, and have a cool buggy to run around and break clays with. Now back to the show. The Dead Pair Podcast is brought to you by the Elite Experience Elite Shotguns and is fueled by Fioki. Oh. Welcome to the Dead Pair Podcast, coming in hot with everything you want to hear about sporting clays. Guy Fieri. How are you, gentlemen? Thanks for having me. Anthony Matteris Jr., how you doing tonight? I'm doing pretty well. Sir. Welcome back, David Radulovic. That's, that's a net positive. <laughs> Brad Kidd. Corey Cruz. Thank you for joining us this evening. Now I feel awkward. With your hosts, Jason Rambo. One more Red Bull for you. And Sean Alley. Woo, yeah! Christmas. Let's do it. Often imitated, but never duplicated. It's the Dead Pair Podcast. The Dead Pair. And now, it's showtime. Welcome back, Mr. Large and in Charge. Yeah, Jason, I think you left the door open again. I did. Well, actually, this guy was invited. Oh, he was? Oh, okay. Welcome to the studio. Make a break, Ed Pretzel. What's up, buddy? <laughs> hey, guys. It's great to be here. Yeah, good to see you in studio, Ed. That's first time and awesome to have you here. It's well, a pleasure. I, I remember at the Ohio State Championship, uh, Mr. Bailey told me, he says, now, if you guys had a voice like him, and I said, well, he's coming in studio. He's like, can you keep him there? I'm like, really? <laughs> you know? So, yeah, it's always quick with a compliment. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. That's, that's Dan, you know. Uh, so, how you been, Ed? I've been good. It's been a great summer. Been busy. Uh, still rolling along here. Have uh, primarily charity Ronald McDonald House type fundraiser events, Boy Scouts in the fall here. So, I'm uh, in, a, in I guess, on the second week of a four-week tour right now here. Nice. To wrap up the season. Gotcha. What well, event are you in town for right now? So, this is the uh, Touched by Cancer event. Uh, Sharon Jenneret, Doug. Jenneret's wife mm -hmm. uh, does an event where she raises money and helps people that my understanding with terminal cancer and then they use yoga as a way to help them with their pain and just getting through the, the situation they're in. Gotcha. Very cool. Yeah. Well, um, we're going to talk about the other reason you're in town here in a minute. All right. Uh, but for those that don't know you, Ed, um, people that are just getting started in the sport, tell us a little bit about your background, how you got started in the clay target world. How I got started in the clay target world. It's uh, so back in 1993, I was doing some shooting with friends and stuff, probably had shot sporting clays for a couple of years, just occasionally. And uh, I was involved in the hunter education program in Minnesota. And one of the uh, events that they did was for the instructors and they had the different shooting disciplines there. And so the people that won each discipline were in charge of taking care of that discipline at next year's venue. And so they would move around the state. And so I won the Sporting Clays event, and the, the next year was going to be at Camp Ripley in Minnesota. And so they didn't have any Sporting Clays, anything there. And so I was tasked with bringing Sporting Clays to Camp Ripley for a weekend. And so as it turned out, a, a friend of mine had bought a Sporting Clays magazine off the newsstand, the way I remember it. And another friend happened to be paging through it and saw the ad for uh, the Bird Brain system and five stand Sporting Clays. And he said to me, he said, hey, here's what we need. We'll just call these guys up. I'm sure they've got a mobile one. And... Uh, We'll bring it in. We'll, let's knock this out. You know what I mean? And so he made the call and found that there wasn't any mobile ones. Five stand at that point was quite new. And uh, so there were just a few five stands even in the United States at that point. Wow. So uh, that kind of kicked off the journey, honestly. Really? Yep. It's funny how this stuff comes about, you know? <laughs> it is indeed. So your business is is Top Gun Shooting Sports. That's right. Um, and the game that you pretty much pervade everybody is Make a Break. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about it? I mean, I'm mo I know most people are probably familiar with it, but give us a quick rundown if you could. So Make a Break is uh, it was created by the same guy that created Five Stand, Raymond Foreman. 
And so his idea with Make a Break was to get to have a game that could attract an audience. He wanted to create a game that was good for TV, that could bring people into the sport by visually being able to watch it. Mm -hmm. And so I think 96 is when they debuted the game, South Padre Island. Scott Robertson was involved heavily in that, that whole thing. And then they worked with uh, National Shooting Sports Foundation. And uh, through a grant, uh, Raymond won an award for the creation of Make a Break uh, from them. And then they put money behind it to get to buy airtime on ESPN and then run this series. And so basically, Make a Break is just a very visual game. It was the first time there'd been a clay target game that had targets that were shot that had a point value on them. So as you guys know, every other game, they're worth a point, no matter how right. easy or no matter how hard. Right. So Raymond's idea was to actually... Put a create a playing field like other games have. There's a defined, it's 50 yards wide, 70 yards deep. Targets have to be broken inside that playing field. Unlike most shooting uh, stands or positions, you've actually got a stage that's three feet high. So now the players themselves are elevated. They're up kind of above the crowd. And, and you know what I mean? That yeah, everybody's a lot, watching. <laughs> a lot of guys talk about those four steps, you know, kind of give, give them the, giving them the shakes yeah. by the time they get up there, especially when there's a good crowd and, you know what I mean, when oh, the pressure's yeah. on. So. I, I, I remember the first time Sean and I shot. Now, you remember it, Cardinal. Yeah. The first time we shot it on film uh, in front of everybody, I remember him visibly shaking. You know? <laughs> oh, dude, it's, it's a lot of pressure when you get up there yeah. the first time. You're like, holy cow, everybody's watching us. <laughs> hey, yeah. You know, I was thinking about the other day, Ed, how much you travel? How many days a year are you on the road? I guess I I never look at it that way. Not, <laughs> Probably try, best not to know, right? Try not to. Right? <laughs> right. A bunch, a bunch, most of them. Uh, I want to say between uh, my son Owen and I, we do somewhere in the neighborhood of forty events in a season. Wow, wow. that's incredible! So, and all over the country. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, uh, never get much west of say Colorado. Okay. Uh, Owen was in uh, Montana this year. He and Jason. Uh, they did the Montana State shoot. Um, we were up in Canada, back up at uh, Oshawa, uh, the gun club up there, so east of Toronto. Um, of course, everywhere down southeast and just mid-United States and stuff. So, yeah, we, we cover a lot of ground. That's incredible. Now, is there anybody else that does what you do? I know that that uh, Mr. Foreman holds the ownership, and I'm sure you pay some kind of licensing fee or whatever for that. That's right, yeah. And now, is there anybody else that, that does it, or are so, you the only one? Um, I guess I'm not sure if there's other mobile guys. I okay. know that uh, Dennis Linden has been a, a licensee in the past, okay. and, and I guess I've not personally seen Dennis in a while, so I don't know if he's still doing it. Okay. But in general, we're kind of the only ones that – that do it at the level that it's done. Yeah, I mean, you're the only one I've ever seen doing right. it. I've seen you right. everywhere. You know? Right, yeah. yeah. So we, we all know you as make a break, Ed. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, like you said, the truth of the matter is is that Raymond owns the license for that. So, um, and you, every event you go to where you have a make a break, you basically have to pay, like, back to him. Like, a, Is it like a royalty or is it just a fee for using the name? It's or? just a license agreement. Okay. So it's a, it's a fee regardless of how many events or whatever. Oh, the current, okay. the current structure anyway. Gotcha. And is it the same for, let's say, a, a club is hosting an event and they would like to have a make a break there. And they say, look, Ed, we're going to have somebody there running it. It's okay. We don't need you to come in. Can they... Purchase that license That's agreement? Right. Yep. Okay. Yep. They would just contact Raymond. Uh, you can get hold of them through the website, makeabreak.com, any of the social sites. And right. Yeah. It's so they, they have to pay a license fee just to use the name. To use the name. So right. yeah, it's, it's about actually having Make a Break and, okay. and advertising that you've got Make a Break. And so one of the things is we want to try and keep some consistency there too. We don't really want the somebody to buy the make a break license and then do the spray painted plywood and no stage. Yeah, and you, right. you guys have seen all the knowledge. <coughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Gotta do it right. Yeah. You gotta do yeah, it right. Yeah. yeah. So it's, 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 it's an image. If, uh, if I invited you guys out for a game of baseball and I brought you out in the field that wasn't mowed and there was maybe only three bases out there and you, you see where I'm going, yeah. no, no baselines, no nothing. You'd be like, yeah, this isn't baseball. This is backyard ball. Right. Right. You know I mean? <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Right. So it's the same thing. It's about creating an image. If you're going to create an audience, you've got to have some consistency. You've got to have an area that people want to be at, that they want to see, right? right? So you guys, the field that we set up currently, uh, obviously, depending on what club we're at and what the terrain is like, it changes a little bit. But you guys have seen that it's attractive. You know what I mean? All the colors and the flags and all the stuff going on, video boards and sound. You know what I mean? It's all about creating an environment 
that people want to be at. Well, mm-hmm. and we've noticed we go to these bigger events. We see you there. We see you at the Jack Links. We see you at, uh, at all of our local tournaments, the bigger ones, the Ohio State shoot. Yeah. And it seems to us every year it grows. And yeah. it draws a bigger and bigger and bigger crowd. So that's got to make you feel great, right? <laughs> it does. It does. <laughs> I mean, we've been, it's one of those uh, Raymond Foreman, I always joke about being a 20 year overnight success. You know what I mean? It just takes yeah. 20 years to be the overnight so, success. So, but it, I mean, you you can comfortably say it, it grows exponentially every year. Yep, yeah, we've we've made huge progress in the last five years. And and frankly, guys, when I st- added the sound and really turned it into a show, and really that, that started, we'd had that idea back in, I'm gonna say 2000, somewhere's in that ballpark. We really came up with a concept of the music and just the way this whole thing would kind of fit together. And so 2005, we did a, a, a TV pilot in Branson, um, put up a bunch of money and had a huge uh, sound and light company out of, out of uh, Toronto come and light it, uh, done it, shot at night, tracer ammo. Most people don't know that it ever happened, have never seen the pictures, but it's it's basically looks like Star Wars, kind of, you know, with the <laughs> tracers and all the stuff. Right. And it was it was amazing, you know, and again, the sound and the walk-up music and just that whole environment. It was all flash targets. Targets were painted the color of the cubes. Powder wow. in the targets was the color of the targets. You know what I mean? It was, it was really cool. Yeah, it was and so cool. we'd had the, the concept for a long time, but again, even after we did that event, then it's always the, the the game of trying to find the money to get behind it, right? To get it to do a yeah. TV series, and at that time, we couldn't find a way to make it cost effective. You know what I mean? With the with the airtime and the commercial time that you could have in there to to make money, we couldn't produce the show for the amount of money that we could make, even. So yeah. So the whole thing kind of went by the wayside, and kind of 2017, 18, right in there is when. I decided, you know, I'm going to see what elements of that I can just pull into my everyday show. You know what I mean? My everyday being at a club, make a break and start to grow it that way, you know? So. Yeah. Well, I remember it was a couple of years back. Uh, Jody Johnson from Rhino Chokes called me. He says, uh, hey, what do you think about two big, cool, giant choke tubes, one on each side <laughs> of the stage shooting off? And I'm like, Jody, that kind of sounds wild. He goes, no, 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 no. And he, he tried to talk me into it. And then I... <laughs> I kind of laughed at first, but then I hung up the phone. I was like, wow, that's kind of a neat idea. Next thing I know, the next time I see you, you got these two giant rhino chokes on the side of the make or break. I'm like, wow, this is cool. Yeah. So, but uh, I, I mean. And so that, those guys too. So we'd just done the, uh, I believe it was a regional was at uh, the Meadows, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, and so we just, so I started out, as I mentioned earlier, added sound. And so I had sound for the first year. I think it was the second year already. So let's say 2019 that I added the CO2 jets. And I'm just working with uh, uh, kind of a uh, stage guy. He does sports events, uh, professional basketball, football and stuff back in Minnesota. And so just kind of picking his brain to see how I could tie it in. And so start doing the CO2 jets. And so Jody and those guys had just seen the show the night before. And so Sunday morning I come, you know, to open up and get ready. And these guys are standing there. They introduce themselves and like, hey, what do you think about some choke tubes over this? And I'm like, dude, that's a great idea. Why not, <laughs> right? Why not? Yeah. Um, so we recently had uh, Blaze Whitehead and Sean Cameter on, and Sean was telling us how ate up he's gotten with the sport. He goes, man, he goes, before I knew it, he goes, I was just going up there and just buying round after round <laughs> after round after round, trying to trying to, trying to to win the tournament try to, or try to win the, uh, the money and all that stuff. Do you see a lot of guys or, and gals like consistently like – certain persons that are always up there yes. competing to win. And there's got to be, an, I mean, I don't know the psychology behind it, but I suppose like gambling or yeah. anything yeah. else. Right. It's got, <laughs> they got to win. Look, come on. Yeah. It's yeah. got its own addiction. Because I think it's one of those things, you know, if you're going out to shoot, like say 50 or 100 sporting plays, I mean, it's a task, right? You're going to mm-hmm. go out and shoot 100 targets and to mentally be in the game for all those targets, it's, it's a job. But this, it's just in bites. You know what I mean? It's yeah. only 10 pair of targets, 10 number ones and 10, you know, two through seven and then four choices. So it, it just, I think it's one of those things that always feels like, you know what, I can manage this. I just got to pull together one yeah. good game and I'm going to have a qualifying score. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> and it's also a little bit of an ego trip too, because there's all kinds of people that call each other out. You know, there's little, little <laughs> grudges and little side bets going on. I mean, we see it all, all, all the time when we, when we go to these shoots. Right. Um, I mean, it, it's amazing how fun. Or, you see people just laughing yeah. and cracking up, and they'll, they'll drop like that one bird, and like, oh, you know, I'm ruined. And you know, they go on about it. it. 
it's hysterical. So oh, I mean, yeah. it's, it's a lot of fun. It draws a big crowd, and yeah. and with all the music and the LED screens and stuff, I mean, you hear you all over the course. You know, when you're right. down by the clubhouses and stuff, so everybody's like, "Oh, I know where the make or break is," and they're, <laughs> yeah, they're heading exactly. over. Yeah, and, and it, how many times is it eating us up that number seven target because <sighs> it's windy or whatever, and you get up there and you, and you miss the one. Yes. It's like, really? Yeah. I just yeah, you're like really easiest target. Focusing on yeah. that seven, that one comes like, crap, oh, there, I shoot it again, then you miss it again, and then you really feel like a, a dum-dum. Yeah, but, and it always seems to happen for you and I when there's about 50 people standing behind us right. watching, you know? Yeah, like, we listen to these guys on the podcast? <laughs> Good <laughs> Lord. <laughs> yeah, we got faces for uh, for radio. So. Yeah. <laughs> I hear you there, guys. Um, so... In an example like Rhino, with all the advertisers coming on board, it's getting more and more attention. Uh, right. You know, is that something that you always had in mind was to have the advertisers and the sponsors of the event? Absolutely. Yeah. When Jody and Scott approached me that Sunday morning and they, you know, gave me some suggestions, I, I hadn't, mind you, thought of the choke tubes on the CO2 yeah. jets, but just about the boundaries and the cubes and the, we already knew that they were all they were all identified as properties right we knew that all these things could could happen um so it was one of those things where i wanted to to get have a few sponsors ready to go so we didn't kind of part way do it you know what i mean so that yeah. it looks nice right out the gate and so that really came on fast honestly so jody and those guys got on and i want to say in that same year so 2021 20, i suppose was the end of um, federal, uh, Jason Nash, those guys, I've been with, uh, Browning, you know, since 1996, I believe it's wow. been a great relationship with those guys, uh, Promatic since 2015. And like I say, so just bringing them on. So with federal, of course, was Remington, you know right. what I mean? So we got those guys on there. Um, so yeah, it's just, uh, and then Rhino chokes coming on board and stuff. So that had the cubes all filled out, uh, federal took the two number ones and then they've got, uh, the Remington three and then the, uh, federal top gun six. And so then I already had Browning on two, and uh, I guess White Flyer is the other one that was. Yeah. I reached out to Robert right after I got off the phone with Federal, and I was saving the four for him. You know what I mean? <laughs> like I just, the orange four, it's got to be White Flyer. So, know? so the seven's available, right? Seven, seven is the Rhino Choke seven. Oh, okay, so, that's yeah, right. Yeah. Right, so we've right. got. So I had them all. Literally, I had them all wrapped up just in a couple of weeks' time. Wow. And so we had all that stuff printed to roll out for the twenty-two season. Then, right. and then since then we've had uh, Bear Pelt has come on. And so they're on the boundaries now. So we're starting to enclose the field, the back boundary. You'll see that screen up that's got, you know, the make or break logos and the game mm -hmm. and Top Gun Shooting Sports. And I've got Federal, Remington, Promatic, Browning is on there. And so now the front boundary is the next one that we're kind of enclosing. So getting rid of the flags and making that nice screen up there. And so Bear Pelt's on there. We're being joined this year by uh, Clay Target Vision. They're coming on. They're the biggest PILA distributor. So they're going to be with us for the uh, 24 season. And then uh, Tetra Hearing is going to be joining us as well. So nice. gotcha. excited to have those guys on too. Well, you know, you've always done it very professionally, but now it it, it just looks like when you walk over to that area where the make or break it, it just now you got that appeal, that feel of I'm getting up on the big stage, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, it, like I said, you've always done it very professional. Yeah, I mean, thank you. But it's just now it's it's got the... The allure of it, just looking across the field, it's like, ooh, I'm going to go shoot that. <laughs> you know? So, um, hey, listen, I got a lot more questions, a lot more I want to dive into. But uh, Tracy Wright is waiting on us. We're going to call him for questions for the coaches real quick. So we will be right back. The Dead Pair. All right. Welcome back to the show, Mr. Tracy Wright. How are you, my friend? I'm doing good, guys. It's good to hear from you. Yeah, Tracy, how's it been going, man? You've been staying busy with the shooting or, or other stuff? Oh, man, I am coaching so much. I think I forgot how to shoot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I got to uh, I gotta slow down and give myself a chance behind the gun, honestly. Yeah, you but, can't uh, forget what that's all about, right? That's right. That's right. But crazy busy in a good way, I guess. That's cool. People are hot to trap for Tracy Wright and wanting to know, pick his brain. So, Sean, you want to <laughs> – I think this gentleman's from Australia, huh, Sean? Yeah, so we got a letter back in August from a guy named Brad Willis, and I'm sure he'll be listening to this. Uh, and he sent us a nice letter about being from Australia, uh, and he asked specifically to speak to you about these questions. So I'm going to ask the first question. I'll awesome. let Jason take the second one. All right, um, sure. I'll try to paraphrase this as much as I can. It's a little lengthy. Uh, his first question, in working and fine-tuning a pre-shot routine, is it acceptable to use positive internal self-talk mantras or words along the way at key points 
within the routine itself or just before stepping into the station to highlight, calm, relax, and remind myself before arriving at the quiet mind and calling pole? Uh, the answer is definitely yes. Um, I have been known to do the same thing and I actually tell students to do this thing. Okay. But I like to limit it to one or two key phrases. Um, in psychology, like if, you know, for instance, if we're treating a client for um, a specific issue, we will usually only address or um, one to two issues at a time. There might be five or 10 different uh, behaviors that we're treating under a diagnosis, but we really trim it down because that's effectively uh, all we can do at a time. So absolutely, one or two key phrases somewhere in your process or in your pre-shot routine is good. Okay, excellent. I'm sure Brad will be happy to hear that. Well, I, yeah. I'm, I'm sure, Brad, if you're listening, you want to use positive affirmation instead of the stuff that I tell myself after the first pair. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely keep it positive in my teaching and my self talk. Everything is uh, is positive based. Uh, well, in relation to that, after you've busted the first pair, uh, the second part of his question is. Could Tracy elaborate and explain, should we be using a post-shot routine and why? And is it different across the disciplines of sporting clay, ski, and trap, depending on what game we play? Um, you know, I mean, so the way that I look at, so the process is basically, in my mind, it's what are all the key components to a perfect shot? Um you know, based off the presentation, what is going to make it perfect? That's going to be like method selection. It's going to be maybe a spot or some detail on the target. It's going to be insertion points. Basically, where do you insert while you're initiating your move and your method? Uh, method selection a lot of time is all about that. And then my pre-shot routine is all about the execution phase. So it's basically, it's kind of like running a PowerPoint of your process with some components in there that basically help you kind of monitor brain speed and to ensure you're in that, that optimum area. So okay. you need to be calm, but alert. Um, but yes, absolutely. And I think, I also think it's really important to have um, a post shot analyst because it keeps referring you back to your process. You need as many factors during your pre or your pre shot routine and your post shot analyst to keep you kind of going back to your process. Um, Tracy, for us dummies, yes, I'm speaking about me. Explain that the difference between a post shot routine and a post shot analyst. So a pre shot routine and a so basically your so your pre shot routine is execution. Your post shot analyst is basically analyzing the shot. So. How well was your plan, basically? So, so, okay, but what I'm saying is there's really not a lot of difference between the post-shot routine and the post-shot analysis, right? As far as... Correct. Yeah, okay, that's what I was getting at. Well, I, I didn't know if you were giving me some kind of voodoo over there, Tracy. I'm like, what are you doing to <laughs> me here? So, so that's your opportunity to make changes to your process. Okay. So basically, if you don't completely feel connected... If you're not in the middle of that target, there's most likely something that you can change to help you get a little bit more connected. And that's your opportunity to kind of evaluate the shot. Was everything, was your plan correct in your process? And then it allows you, that's your opportunity to basically relabel things and uh, make corrections to your process if needed. I'm sure that, and, and so, okay, I, I'm going to, why I'm asking you all kind of questions here, Tracy. Uh, no, that's okay. Uh, so in relation to that, I'm sure this changes as you get more towards the top of the game. But a lot of times for me in that post shot, and when you said you may even change how you approach the target, right, like your method or whatever, yep. a lot of the times for me, if, if I'm slowing myself down and actually asking myself, did you execute your plan? 90% yes. of the time, if it's a miss, it's no. So mm -hmm. it's not mm -hmm. that I picked the wrong lead or the wrong, uh, you know, the wrong move, or the wrong method. 90% of the time I did not execute my plan. Would you agree that as you get more into the top or the upper echelon of the game, it's not so much did you execute is, you know, did you see it well or was your whole point off? Am I right in saying that? 
So I, I would honestly, I almost feel like it's the other way. So I almost feel like newer shooters are probably a li- struggle a little bit more to execute their plan. And I think that more experienced shooters, it's usually something a little bit more subtle, like insertion point or visual discipline when they pulled the trigger. Right. Okay. Um, for me, it's usually, um, did I nail my insertion point and was I visually disciplined when I pulled the trigger? Gotcha. Usually is what I'm trying to fine tune. Well, Tracy, we really appreciate the time, man. It's always great to have you on the show, and and obviously all your knowledge can help our listeners a great deal. Thanks so much for having me. It's always a pleasure, guys. All right, we'll talk to you soon. Talk soon, Trace. Take care. The Dead Pair. It's always good to hear from Tracy and Sean. Yeah, he's a great coach and a lot of information. Wealth of knowledge. Um, Ed, getting back into things... um, so is there any ideas for changing anything in the game or maybe throwing an entirely new game or any quirks or anything you guys have discussed that you can share with us? Not really. I would say that... Wait, uh, wait, wait. Not really you can <laughs> share with us or not really that you're going to change? <laughs> no, well, some of both, really. And, uh, okay. So there's really no... I mean, the game, I think, is really the game that we want to have overall. Make or break the way it is now. You know what I mean? Some people don't like to have to shoot at the number one target. I say it's... Well, if you don't miss it, it's not a big deal. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But but guilty. it's like, guilty. The the reason it's there, the reason uh, Ray Foreman put it in there is just what you talked about before, Jason. You're it, you've got to focus on it as well. And so yeah. any of the, any of the big guns, any of the pro shooters will tell you that the, your shooting brain and your math brain, your you know the logical reasoning brain are two different areas. You know what I mean? So yeah. part of the challenge of make a break is that you're you're stepping out of your shooting mindset you know what i mean when you've got to stop and look at the scoreboard and do the math and you're you're like you guys talked about you were doing a tournament or shooting head to head for charity so you've got an audience watching you it's on the line you don't want to look silly right so but you got to stop and do this math decide what you're going to shoot and i think what happens to a lot of guys with all that pressure is they're thinking about the big move the yeah the, the big points target right whether that's the three or the seven whatever it is and they, if that one, if you're not paying attention and locked in in your yeah, brain, it will bite you. Been there, done that. <laughs> yeah, that's for it sure. Will bite you. It will sting. <laughs> yes. Um, so, like I say, just I just want to say again, the game, the way it's created, I think, is the game that we want to take forward, and that has the legs. You know what yeah. I mean? To to go the distance. As far as new games, uh, Raymond has got a, a couple in the hopper. Oh, nice. That would be. Uh, it would be incredible. Uh, there's one in particular that I'm looking forward to, and I'm just not sure at this point when that might come about. To okay. Kind of think about it, but right. it's uh, it's in the works for sure. Well, as far as the the game is as it is, I I love it. I think it's awesome. What about like I you know you're down there writing scores in right? Yep. What about like a digital scoreboard? Right. Has that ever been thought about or talked about? Not not only has it been thought about, but it's been talked about and it's it's been created already. Oh, really? So we were ready, I want to say July, somewhere in there is when the uh, computer, the programmer guys and stuff had everything ready to go. And so this is more than just a scoreboard. This will be, honestly, for clubs looking forward that want to have make or break, this would take my place. Really? Right? So part of the challenge, I think, from a club perspective is you've got somebody in there, if they don't really know the game, you know what I mean? You've got a, uh, a kid, let's say, in there that's just going to throw the targets or whatever. They, If they don't know the game well, it slows everything down. And let's face it, it's just not the same game if you're waiting for somebody to do the yeah. scoring and all the rest, right? So, so this system... Uh, Basically, it's still part of the bird brain computer thing, you know what I mean? But it's its own program. It'll do the score. It'll throw the targets. Like, it, it's, I'll be able to do even, like, on the tournament stuff. So when we're playing for a top eight or qualifying and stuff like that, this will have the queue. So when you come sign up, you're going to be able to eventually, when all the stuff that's programmed into this is put into play, it would be about, like, the Promatic Claymate system where you can come up with your card as soon as you put it on the thing, it's going to recognize Sean, Jason, whatever. It's going to know your class, your information. You're basically going to download credits onto that system, and you're going to decide if you want to play practice or you want to shoot to qualify. It's going to keep track of all that. There will then be on that screen, it'll be a queue line. People will be able to just look and see where they are in the queue about how long it's going to be before they shoot. There will also be another screen that shows the placing of everybody. So now if you're playing, let's say, the... If you're in the top class or the second class, whatever it is, you can see who the top eight or top four scores are currently, what those scores are. When you get up to actually play the game, 
as you shoot and make your decisions, you'll get to see all the time, it'll be telling you what your possible score is if you pick the highest targets. You know what oh, I mean? Oh, so, wow. So you're gonna be able to see that. You're, That's you're, very cool. So this scoreboard's out in front of the shooters even. Yeah, yep. So they don't, there's no sitting there looking around the corner at your right, board. Right. They, they know it's up in front of them it's, what they gotta yep. hit. I, oh, I'm, wow. Again, part of this right now is trying to figure out logistics, right? So right now I'm thinking off to the left side a little bit, corner, diagonally. One of the things I'm looking at is the auto loaders chucking empty shells yeah. against TV screens. You know what I mean? There's right. always those kind of things you got to yeah. take into consideration. But right now I'm thinking left side. That way, the other thing for me logistically is to try and have as few screens as possible, right? So just the amount of stuff that we already truck around. So have that screen so that the players can see it, so that I, as a referee, can see that screen as well will be good. There'll be the screen behind me where people are signing up. They can see the queue line, scores, all of that. And then based on that system or whatever, we should be able to... You know, they, they can hook up with all the different technology too, the Bluetooth yeah. or Wi-Fi or whatever, right? I mean, if they want to run it on a screen in the clubhouse or whatever, we'll, we'll have that technology or those options available as well. So that is very cool. Looking well, forward to it. Like I say, it's just the challenge for us, honestly, as you guys mentioned before, it seems like we're at the big events. And so the challenge has been, when do we bring this in and really test, you know yeah. what I mean? As far as how we want it set up and just th work through the logistics of it is... It's been a challenge time to find the time and the event that we can do. The that one in. thing, the one thing about that that'll disappoint me though is the guys that stand up there. And Ed, you do this every day. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> guys that stand up there, and they're up by one point, and they think they got to choose a one seven. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like, why are you doing that? Just pick a one three. Make the guy fight for his next set of points. You know. And right. They, one seven, and then they hit the one and miss a seven. It's like, okay, great. Now you're two points up. All he's got to do is hit a one three, and he just smoked. But it. then you're you know? under, you're making the assumption that people's brains work normally under pressure. Which, which <laughs> they don't. Well, they but they with do this, well, with this taking that math out of the equation and it telling them this is all you need to hit. Absolutely. Right. Then you don't see them bombing that. Seven all the time. <laughs> yeah. How many? I, I'm sorry, Sean. I know you got a question for me. I, I, real quick, while this is on the tip of my brain. How many targets do you load in that seven machine versus all the other machines? Yeah, so the six and the seven typically are going to eat up. So ones are 50% of the targets. And between that six and seven, that's easily another 30% of the targets. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's crazy. I see it all the time. <laughs> Guys yeah, are in the we've done up. it. One six, one seven, one seven, <laughs> one six, one seven, one six. But yeah. um, well, yeah, other awesome. than make or break, I mean, you also do some other stuff. So you help out with, with regular sporting events and clubs and stuff like that. As you travel around the country, what is your general consensus here in the last few years? I mean, do you feel the sports growing and continuing to, to push forward? Yeah, I mean, I feel like it is. I, the numbers seem to be up at a lot of the events and that sort of thing. So uh, to your point, when we come into any of these facilities, each of our trailers has uh, roughly 42 machines, respectively, on it. One's got 44, one's doing 40 right now. And so we come in and... and do the make or break, but then the rest of those machines are being used by the club somewhere, whether it's on a main event course, a practice course, five stands, you you name it. You know what I mean? So we, we're kind of full service in that regard. You know what I mean? We bring a pretty good size footprint as far as machines in for these clubs to use. But yeah, the, like you say, everything's come up. Uh, it's It's been on a reasonable increase, especially the kids stuff, man. Uh, you know, those oh, we, yeah. we've started mm -hmm. to roll into doing more of those events. I mean, obviously the future is there. And so we're trying to do some of the the uh, kids events, the bigger state shoots, that sort of thing, SCTP type stuff and regional events to just get get it growing there more. Uh, SCTP Nationals, of course, is huge for us. Oh, yeah. I mean, there we had three make or breaks this year and there was lines at them, you know, I mean, all day, basically. For yeah. that 12, um, 12 days or whatever. Right. And speaking of that, speaking of the youth. You're working on something that's going to be huge for this sport. I, I really believe that. Okay. <laughs> I mean, this is going to be the, what what did I call it earlier, Sean? It's going to be the, uh, the, the days, days of, of thunder, thunder for yeah, our sport. For, for yeah. sporting clays. Right. Um, tell us a little bit about that, Ed. So, yes, as much as you can. As much right? as I can. So, so basically, um, as I mentioned before, we did that 2005 footage down in Branson. And we'd been working for quite some time to try and get like a TV show series, something like that. And through that process, we met uh, we met a guy by the name of Russell Jones. It's uh, in the in the movie industry, and so he's done TV and movie as well. And got to talking to him about the feasibility and just trying to how could we pull this off. And so 
he didn't know as much about the shooting side. And so I said, you know what, why don't you, uh, why don't you come to the SHOT Show? I'll get you at the SHOT Show and maybe we'll meet some people. I'll introduce you to some guys and, you know, see what, what you think we could maybe do. And so one of those meetings was Tom Wandrash with SCTP. And I, I'll never forget, we're sitting there and Russell's sitting across the table and Tom, Tom's talking about the kids and all this. And all once this big grin starts to come over Russell's face and his head starts bobbing a little bit, you know what I mean? And he doesn't, doesn't say much, you know what I mean? We get out of that meeting, I'm like, Russell, what's the... A movie. We got to do a movie. He said, you know, the, the Transformers is a two hour commercial for, for General Motors. He said, he said, we'll do a movie for this sport. He said that and he said, think of the possibility as far as the advertisement. Wow, and just so cool. Spreading it, you know. So, yeah, that is so, amazing. So that's, the idea was launched and within and that same. So this was early January 2018. That summer already we had uh, with the help of Cardinal Center, uh, we did second unit footage there. And so the idea is really kind of if everybody's seen the Mighty Ducks movie, this is the Mighty Ducks with shotguns. So the whole backstory, you know what I mean? That the team that's not so good and the, the romance kind of between the the new coach and the and the, uh, the the love interest of the past. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there's a lot of family aspects to this too. Uh, our character's relationship with his father is strained. It starts off that he's trying to make the Olympics is really how the movie is going to kick off one of the earlier scenes, and then through a series of events, he leaves shooting altogether, and then kind of comes back again through a series of events and gets roped into helping this kind of ragtag bunch of kids become a, a shooting team. Wow. Well, you know what's so cool about this? I mean, me and Jason, we talk all the time on the show about bringing new people in and introducing people to the sport. So, but one of the hard things to do is to try to explain to people that have never seen it right. what's actually happening. I mean, we equate it, you know, golf with shotguns, sure, sure. <laughs> uh, that kind of stuff. But the amazing thing is if you actually get a person out on the course right. and you put a gun in their hand and you watch them break their first target, it's like something miraculous happens. Yeah, that's yeah. And, and until they do that. Yep. They you just can't explain it or let them or allow them to visualize what's really going on. I was just at an event a couple of weeks ago back in Minnesota. It's a, a Rochester area builders do a big event, and so the guy that heads that up that that just switched positions this year. So it was a guy that's got a ton of experience with golf, had never fired a gun in his life, and he said we were visiting about it a little bit. He's watching him shoot sporting clays, and he's just amazed at this thing that's happening. You know what I mean? I'd set up a twenty station course on private property and. They've got, they had, I think they had 180 people out there or something, you know. And so he's watching, he said, this is amazing. So they do a kid's event two days later. And I said, you know, if you want, I'd be happy to, you know, introduce you, help, you know, take some shots. I can get you to break a few targets. And so he took me up on that on that Saturday. And to your point, Sean, when I think it was either his second at the most, it was his third shot. He crushes the target. And, and it was it was miraculous. Yeah, yeah. He's almost yeah. levitating the yeah. smile. I mean, yeah. this guy's in his 50s, oh, yeah. you know yeah. what I mean? And the smile that came over his face. It's so gratifying. Yeah. yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, I, had, I had the same thing happen last weekend. I was, I was uh, at the Kids in Clay event. And one of the guys on the squad borrowed a shotgun, never really fired a shotgun. Right. And for the first two or three stations, he's really struggling. Hasn't broken a target yet. And I'm watching him. And all of a sudden, I realize he's got his head crooked all the way over to the <laughs> right. And I'm like, are you left eye dominant? And he goes, I don't know. I've never, I've never tried. And he goes, so I did the test. Yeah. Sure enough, he's left eye dominant. I said, put that gun in your left shoulder. The minute he did that on the second target, he broke it. And then the rest of the day, <laughs> all smiles, all happy. He was ready to go. He goes, well, I'm going to buy a left-handed gun. I'm like, yes, you should. Yeah. Yes, you should. Um, the movie, does it have a name? The movie, the name that we're going with right now is called One Last Shot. Nice. One Very Last cool. Shot. Very and cool. Now, you guys have some social media and stuff where people can follow along with all this and see some promotional stuff, right? Yep. So so we're working on that right now. In fact, we're out here on a scouting mission, getting stuff ready. We're kind of in the pre-production stages right now. The, the hope is to be filming everything actually at SCTP Nationals next summer and then either side of the actual event. Okay. But that, that the filming will happen live at that. And so... Obviously, SCTP plays a big role in it with the kids' teams and, and that sort of thing. And so, uh, yeah, they're, we'll, Very cool. we'll have all that stuff up and going here just in the next couple of weeks. But uh, That's awesome. we're on an exciting trajectory right You're now. Still, yeah. still doing some little uh, actor interviews to see who's going to line up for this? Or? Yeah, that's, that's not really my, my yeah. department, you know what I mean? So, but, but I'm keeping abreast of all that. And there's they've got some pretty cool names that they're talking with right now. Uh, yeah, I know. I got the phone call. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, Sean, how do you do it? <laughs> Every day, man. Every day. It's a struggle. <laughs> Oh, hey, I got to be good for something. I ain't got anything else. I got to have some one-liners. So, but, um, and I, you know, your business, you, 
not only put on make or break events, um, you help clubs out with traps when they need it, help put on events. Yeah. If somebody's looking to get a hold of you, what's the best way to find you? So honestly, they, we, we haven't done a Top Gun Shooting Sports website. We're on Instagram and stuff, but honestly, just my phone number is, okay. is the way to get hold of me. So 602-697-4025 is my is my number that's directly to me. So you, you, can you heard the man in charge. There he is. Yeah, well, we're <laughs> going to put that right down in the show description too. So if yeah. anybody's hearing this and they need to follow up with you, you yeah. know, they can go yeah. right to the show description and check it out. Um, you know, Sean, every week we tell someone, or tell everybody, take someone new shooting, take them to a tournament. Man, take them up, shoot some make a break. Heck yes. You know Heck what I yes. mean? Uh, show them how much fun we have. I think we have more fun at make a break than we do the tournament. Well, and half the, the fun's Eddie makes you feel like a rock star when he's up there calling out your numbers. <laughs> I know, right? You know, well, it's not me. <laughs> well, not me either, but Give me a you one still seven. feel good when yeah. you're up there. <laughs> All right, Ed, I'll go with the one seven. One point. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. All righty then. That's your call. The part yeah. I didn't see, Sean, is I didn't even look at the seven when he shot. I didn't know what the score was. <laughs> <laughs> he had some intuition. I asked for that one. I asked for that one. But no, even with you guys, you know, when you're up there doing your charity stuff, I mean, it's the, the fun thing about make a break is it's, it, it, let's face it, we're in an age that's big on instant gratification. Yeah. And so now we don't have to get to the end of the 14 station course to find out who the winner is. You know what I mean? It's back and forth, right. shot to shot. Yep. And so at any moment you can take the lead or lose the lead. You know. Yeah. So, well, it, what's neat about it is it is it's heads up. Right. You know, you're shooting against the guy next to you. Yeah. You know, you're not shooting against a whole tournament full of people. Right. right. It's you and the guy next to you, you know, and it, that's, <laughs> I think that's what makes it fun. Well, and even if you don't win the tournament or place or whatever, if you can go up there and beat somebody at make a break, then you can walk walk home with your head held high. <laughs> like, I won that, you know, I got that going on. <laughs> well, the last five times I shot against you, that's why I got gratified because you kicked my butt on the course. Uh, <laughs> so it's like, come on, Sean, let's go shoot some make a break, you know? <laughs> so it happened in Chicago. Ed saw it firsthand. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I yeah. fell apart. Wheels came off, and the frame was dragging the ground. Yeah. So. All right, Sean Alley walks out of the 16. Jason's on the 42. You know, so that was. Eh, it might not have been that far apart, <laughs> but you know, it's your story. You tell it the way you want to. Yeah. All right, I'll give you a 26. <laughs> so. But no, it's it's just a lot of fun, and I think this is another reason. You know, like like I said, we tell everybody every week take somebody and you shoot and take them to a tournament. But this is part of the fun that happens at a tournament. Absolutely. And you know, I think if more people would. Take it seriously what we tell them every week and, you know, set a goal for yourself to, you know, this year I'm taking two new people, Yeah. you know, and if, if they, if it's not their thing and they don't want to keep doing it, that's fine. Maybe even they can enjoy it recreationally. Yeah. And know? if you're, if you're a local shooter, stretch your legs a little bit, get out of state, yes. go to some of the big blasts, you know, visit a, a regional, visit the Jack Links, visit the nationals. I mean, it's, it's worth going just to experience it. And, you know, Ed, I was looking at your Facebook page earlier. It's got all the events you're going to be at throughout the yeah, year. Yeah, that's you know? right. Yep. So if anybody's intrigued by this podcast talking to you and they're like, you know what, I think I'm going to try that. They can go right on that Facebook page and find an event. Yep. And so that's all make a, make a break dot com or then make a uh, official make a break is Instagram. And like you say, Facebook as well. Yeah. And so that schedules up there. Uh, that's current uh, schedule right now date. So we're still adding to that. That's not our final schedule for 2024, but we've got okay. a, a ton of them up there already. Very cool. So yeah, come, come check us out. Come see it. Yeah, good. Deal. Absolutely. Well, we got some sponsors. We got to thank elite shotguns. You know, uh, Browning is part of your program absolutely. and they can go to elite shotguns and get themselves a Browning. Somewhere. Absolutely. Um, amongst others. Amongst others. Yes. Uh, you were both, I don't know how this happened. We're going to have to talk to each other's wives, but we're both wearing <laughs> Fioki shirts today. Got to represent. Got to represent. Um, love me some Fioki ammunition. Yep. Little rhinos. Uh, Bear Pelt, now, now also a part of your program. Yep. Um, excited to have those guys on. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. We just had Zach and Desi on talking about some new products from them. Excited about that. Yep. Uh, Atlas Traps. No, Ed, I'm, I'm, I'm going to refrain. I'll be nice. Be good. I'll be, be good. nice. So, uh, but no, American made Atlas Traps. We love Atlas Traps. By the way, just talked to Scott Manspeaker from Atlas Traps on the way in, and he has donated an AT50 for the Dead Pair Blast. Uh, we oh, are, nice. We are going to random draw uh, an entrant. Uh, just pull their name, and they're going to be the recipient of a brand new AT50 for oh, your backyard. That's, that's so. very nice. Um, RE Ranger also heard from them recently, Sean. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Uh, they're going to have some swag packs to give away at the Dead Pair Blast. Uh, Odo Pro Technologies. 
love a Samoda Pro. Those girls over there are awesome. Uh, Call Dr. Grace. She'll sort you out. Yes. And I think they said they wanted to do something for Dead Pro Blast. Yeah, I think they were going to send some uh, some of the foamies or the, the moldable yeah. ones. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and back up on that, Bear Pelt is donating gun socks, gun socks. to all the winners of each class uh, at the Dead Pair Blast. Of course, Rhino Chokes, Ed, again, a uh, fellow sponsor of yours. Great. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we got the fireworks shooting that, off. That's the new Jason gun right there. That way your pattern's as big as a trash can lid. So. <sighs> this isn't on film, so nobody saw that. Ed, Ed saw it. He laughed. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> all right ladies and gentlemen welcome to the edited portion of the podcast uh don grant you know she needs a specific mental training course for make a break because Ooh. that's a whole different mindset on that make a break stage than it is on a tournament yeah get that pressure up that's right yeah uh-huh. uh the lovely miss don grant of course vero beach clay shooting uh home of the dead pair blast december 1st and 2nd uh ed you visit that place every once in a while you like that club don't you I love the club yes. beautiful club um do you are you going to be setting up there anywhere this I'm, year i'm not scheduled to be there right now but okay. i've been down there with uh with uh, some of the guys the other sponsors and stuff just helping out yeah um, of course, white flyer targets. I know you throw you some white flyer targets. Love my white flyer targets. Absolutely. Yes. We uh, we love to cuss them on one and seven. So uh, <laughs> yes, we do. But, uh, and then of course, score chaser. Uh, sign up for a tournament anywhere that Ed is going to be. Lovely Miss Casey Chase, and we're going to be talking to her here soon, along with White Flyer, an upcoming uh, upcoming episode. So. Well, Sean Alley, what do you think, buddy? I think this has been great, Ed. It's great to have you in the studio. I yes. think you're doing such great things with the sport. Um, really excited about the movie, obviously. Yeah. So that's very yeah. cool to share with us. Um, and yeah, good luck at the at all the events coming up. So, hey, thank you guys. It's been my pleasure to be here. Thanks for any, the invite. And any closing thoughts, Ed? You're just gonna have to have to have me back again. I'll keep you up to date on the movie. Is I this love thing it. Progressive. Yeah, don't threaten us with a good time. You're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome anytime. That's now awesome. now we got two studios, one in Florida, one in Ohio. So anytime you're in either place, look us up. And Perfect. You're welcome to come, come in. Come on in. Yeah. All right. Great. I'll Absolutely. Do it. Well, Sean Alley. Until next week. Catch you all back here on the Dead Pair Podcast. We'll see you next time on the Dead Pair Podcast. The Dead Pair. The Dead Pair Podcast is brought to you by Elite Shotguns and Vero Beach Clay Shooting and is fueled by Fioki USA. The Dead Pair theme song was written, arranged, and produced by Toby Tomplay. Special thanks to the following sponsors. Bear Pelt, Rhino, Odo Pro, Dawn Grant, Atlas Trap Company, RE Ranger, and White Flyer Targets. 